Uh, moving right along, our next panel is called Taking a Stand. So, you know, taking a stand can be scary, it can be challenging, it can be a lonely thing to do, especially when you may be taking a stand against something like a government. Uh, these folks are going to talk about how to have courage in the act of taking a stand. Um, all of our panelists are subject matter experts, so we're going to do this in a slightly non-traditional fashion. Um, but I'm excited to introduce David Hughesby, the co-founder and CEO of Cryptid Technologies, who is going to quote unquote moderate, i.e. participate in the next panel. It's a small panel, but it is a panel of giants in the space, so I'm excited about it. All right, take it away, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> so this panel is called Taking a Stand. And not that the other panels weren't important, but this one actually has a call to action in it, and it actually is directed at every one of us in this room. And um, before we get started, I wanted to point out that one of my greatest inspirations to take a stand was probably one of the greatest hacker activists in our generation. It was a young man named Aaron Swartz. Yes, he does deserve a round of applause. Um, he is most well known for being probably the first person to weaponize the organizing power of the internet, to raise the signal and lower the noise of the desires of individual people so much that the people who are in charge, who have power and money, had to listen to us. He organized the, you know, helped organize the resistance to the SOPA bill, the Stop Online Privacy Act, and the PIPA bill, and really showed the power that the internet can have for individuals to come together to self-organize, for us to, um, you know, as the Constitution says, get together and petition our government, right? And uh, sadly, we mark the 10th anniversary of his passing this last January, and I just wanted to bring it out that Taking a stand does have a cost. A lot of us lose friends, lose family, lose jobs, lose access to financial services, which is what we're gonna talk about here today. And I know that when that kind of heat comes down on each one of us, it can feel profoundly isolating. And sadly, I think that's one of the key factors in why Aaron took his life. I think he, found, he felt profoundly alone and didn't have anybody on his side. And so before we get started, I wanna take just 15 seconds and I'm gonna ask everyone in here because we're all here for a reason. This is take a stand, so these people are sympathetic to this idea. Just take 15 seconds and introduce yourself to the people next to you. Just say, hi, I'm so-and-so, please, 15 seconds. All right, now you're not alone anymore. You know people who have the same thoughts you do and I just don't want ever to hear about any one of you doing what Aaron did because you're so alone, you're not alone. I will miss you, okay? You will be missed, there are people who love you. So, you know, take a stand, have conviction and Build your community around you and just remember that you are human and we love you. And don't do what Aaron did, please don't. So with that, um, we're here to talk about financial, we're actually, we wanted, we talked backstage and we wanna talk about financial uh, privacy, financial surveillance and censorship. Um, before we get there, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna introduce myself, so. Um, I'm Dave Hughesby, co-founder, CEO of a company called Crypto Technologies. There's a company I built to take a stand, very specifically. I wrote some blog posts that put our values out there publicly and stated our commitment to how we were going to build the solutions we did. I proposed a definition of decentralization to be the direction in which user sovereignty increases. And then I wrote another blog post outlining six fundamental principles of user sovereignty. 
such things such as privacy by default, pseudonymity by default, open file formats and protocols everywhere, open and strong encryption for all uh, transactions, who, not what, for authorization, and lastly, um, a user-directed, consent-driven power structure. And since then, we have put in a lot of effort to address the needs of, well, I guess the first product that we're launching addresses the fact that the government does have a legitimate interest in regulating financial transactions. You know, coming from the hacker community, it was really easy for me to be like, you know, to heck with the government. But I don't think that's the right way to be. I don't think it's the right choice to stick your head in the sand and hope the government's going to be nice to you. And so we built technology, it's open source, open technology, that allows us to, to do financial transaction compliance in zero knowledge. So this is the native language of cryptocurrencies and Web3. And I am trying to approach the government with my hand out and a smile on my face and say, I recognize your legitimate interest in doing this. Here's how we want to be regulated. We, would, we want to comply, but we want to do it in our native language, which is cryptography. And it's been tough. Taking a stand um, is difficult. And so one of the things that we build, or the thing that gives me hope, is that in these transactions, we provide a way for people to be private by default. But if there is ever a warrant issued, there is a way to walk back and find out who the counterparties are. This is perfect Fourth Amendment privacy. It's how I think it should be done. And, you know, shout out to my buddy Wayne. He said to me earlier, isn't that the American way to do it? And I think so. So enough said from me. I'm going to focus on my co-panelists here. So I've got Anaya Robinson, ACLU of Colorado, senior policy strategist. Excellent. And yes, <laughs> thanks for being here, Anaya. Marta Belcher, who is, I've known Marta for a long time. Uh, we met many years ago back at EFF, I believe, right? And um, Marta is now president of Filecoin Foundation and general counsel for Protocol Labs. So, <laughs> giants in this field. <clears throat> so I'm gonna pose you a question to both of you. In the interest of, or under the topic of financial surveillance and censorship, okay? I think we'll start with Anaya. I'm gonna put you on the spot, Anaya. What is your greatest concern in that topic? And if you were dictator for a day and could rewrite any piece of policy, what would it be? It's a loaded question, Dave. <laughs> um, I think today, because the answer to that question, I think changes constantly working in policy um, and specifically like tech and data surveillance in policy. Um, but there's been, especially in the past week, several bills introduced in states across the US uh, around gender affirming care and reproductive rights, um, limiting the ability to utilize credit card processing transactions to pay for gender affirming care, reproductive access, um, in states that are trying to erode access to those civil rights and civil liberties. And I think that in conjunction with a lot of the other pieces of technology that the government is using as surveillance tools while eroding our rights um, is real, right? We have states like Texas that is really trying to limit people's ability to access life-saving care um, and states like Colorado that have embedded protections for that care. And when folks move between spaces, the government in Texas can utilize facial recognition to know where they're going. They can utilize ALPRs to know where they're going. They can utilize credit card transactions to know what they're paying for. They can utilize period trapper, tracker apps to understand whether or not it was the right time in somebody's cycle to come to Colorado, spend that money in the space that it shows up on their credit card statement, and then drive back to Texas, and as soon as they can get back there, could be arrested and prosecuted for accessing 
reproductive care in a different state. Okay. And this is continuing to happen and continuing to build in states across the country. These bills have been introduced in 43 states so far in 2023. Yes. Um, and it's an erosion of rights, right? And it's an erosion of our ability to access who we are, have bodily autonomy, and show up in spaces authentically while the government is surveilling us and disallowing us that access while criminalizing it on top of just the removal of the access to. Um, so I think one of the realms of financial surveillance that I'm the most concerned about is that government ability to access that information and know what we are spending our money on, when, where, and why, and then prosecute us for it, for making choices that should lie only within ourselves and the people that we choose to have those conversations with. And the government should have no voice and no say in that, and no voice and no say in whether or not credit card processing companies can be able to process those transactions in the first place. So how would you, like you could write a law, how would you, would, you, would it be something like a financial tra transaction privacy law? Like what kind of policy would you recommend? Yeah, um, I mean, removing the ability for that surveillance, right? I think in a lot of spaces, um, but when it comes to personal data, specifically around biometric data too, um, not, not allowing the government access to that information. So making sure that that data cannot be shared to government entities on any level of government, and that there is con a consent-based process when companies are collecting that type of data too. Um, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of opt-in, uh, and I think that in any regard, the government should not have access to that level of personal data of anyone who lives in this country. So Marta, what would you say as being someone who works from the legal side of this and has been very close to cryptocurrencies and you know the EFF and privacy tech, um, what would your greatest concern be? And maybe address Anaya's uh, uh, suggestions here, like how, what kinds of tools do you think we could deploy to achieve such a thing? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, there's something very interesting happening at this moment in time in the cryptocurrency space, which is that what we're seeing is the mass surveillance of the traditional financial system being extended onto cryptocurrency. And for some reason, for decades, we have just come to accept it as completely normal that our financial transactions are turned over to the government in the United States by default without a warrant in what is effectively a mass surveillance program. Um, and what we're seeing right now is this moment where that is increasingly being applied to cryptocurrency. And we're seeing a lot of very concerning uh, bills, but also regulations, um, and even things like what happened with Tornado Cash, where suddenly regulators and governments are trying to make sure that cryptocurrency transactions are also fully transparent to the government and also turned over to the government by default. That is a really interesting moment in time because I think it gives us a moment to reflect on the mass surveillance that happens in the financial system and not just fight about should it be extended to cryptocurrency, but should it be happening at all, right? Um, and I think that uh, what's going on right now is really unconstitutional in my view. I believe that if we were to take this up to the Supreme Court now, that the Supreme Court would actually agree with us. And so in answer to your question of what would I change, the thing that I would change uh, is the third party doctrine. So what the third party doctrine is, there's this idea, right, that we balance the reasonable needs of law enforcement with the civil liberties of people through the Fourth Amendment, which says that what you need to do in order to get information about citizens is you need to go, if you're law enforcement, and get a warrant. You have to have probable cause, get a judge to issue a warrant, and then you can get information about individuals. So why is it that our financial transactions are turned over to the government by default? Why doesn't the government need to go get a warrant? The answer is the third party doctrine. It's this very outmoded doctrine and the idea is that once you've turned over your information to a third party, 
you have lost your reasonable expectation of privacy in that information. Now, that was one thing in the 1970s, right, at the time that this doctrine was coming about, where the information you gave to third parties was very limited. But now we live our entire lives through a handful of corporations. All of us are sending information to third parties literally every second. Um, and it really doesn't make sense anymore. And in recent years, what we've really been seeing is the Supreme Court recognizing that, recognizing that the, the details you can get from someone's life through third parties today is really paints an intimate portrait of their life and chipping away at the third party doctrine. Um, so the thing that I would change um, is that I would, um, I would do away with the third party doctrine. Um, and you know, I have to say, I do think that in this moment in time, when we have the moment where suddenly cryptocurrency and people who actually care about privacy are suddenly facing these regulations that everyone has taken as totally fine for the last few decades in the traditional banking system, I think we have a really interesting moment where we can challenge that kind of surveillance, not only on cryptocurrency, but also the rest of the financial system. So now here's the tough one. How do we turn this into taking a stand? How can everybody here participate? How can they, how can we push back? You know, I, I brought up Aaron earlier. He was really good at getting everybody on the internet to say, hey, stop it, right? How could we do that collectively? I mean, what I'm doing is they can have all the zero knowledge proofs for me. I, they want, I don't care. That's the point of zero knowledge proofs. Um, and I like the third party doctrine, but I'm not sure how that would translate into law. Maybe you can comment on that. And same thing here also for the reproductive health stuff, right? Maybe something applies like that to insurance companies as well. Um, it sounds like the financial transaction privacy stuff would go a long ways to help that. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we have two minutes. So how are you gonna take a stand, Marta? And then Anaya, like real quick. Super quickly. Hello. Super quickly, I think there are um, so many amazing organizations, including the ACLU, um, including EFF, including Fight for the Future, Coin Center, who are really taking on these issues head on, also the Blockchain Association, um, including all of the arguments that I, I just talked about with the third party doctrine and really um, not only challenging uh, things that involve cryptocurrency, but actually challenging the constitutionality in general. So I would say supporting those organizations is actually really incredible. There's some incredible work with the organizations here today are doing. Anaya? Yeah, I think um, in the realm of policy, uh, all of the pushback that we get on getting data and tech privacy legislation through comes from tech companies. That's where all of the pushback comes. So the more folks in this field who are willing to come and work with us and stand with us and fight for these policies at the legislative level, at all levels of government, changes that narrative so that legislators understand that the entire tech industry isn't against them to push for these regulations. Um, but when we don't have folks who understand the language, understand the nuance, understand how this tech works at its core, we can't explain to legislators and to regulators why it needs to change and why law enforcement and other entities shouldn't have this level of access to our personal data. I, I can't, as a policy dude, like I can't explain that level of nuance. <laughs> to legislators, so like, I need more tech folks to come with me to help me write these bills in the ways that make the most sense so that we can get them passed and increase protection from government surveillance and increase protection for our everyday lives. Thanks, well, we're just about out of time. I just wanna remind everybody here that um, it, cryptography itself and the organizing power of the internet itself are real forms of power and their power that is available and uh, deployable by individuals. Cryptography used correctly can resist any amount of money and any amount of will to break it. And using the internet to get the message out to millions of people, potentially billions of people, to talk about an issue that's common to all of us has incredible power as well. So, I encourage all of you to think about how you can take a stand. And you're all here at 
Uh, ETH Denver, you must know a little bit about cryptography and the internet. Maybe those tools can help you take your stand. Thank you. <laughs>